chapter 12, <clears throat> we are going to begin a new series of teachings that will be taken from this 12th chapter of the book of Matthew. We're going to call this series The Sign of Jonah. And uh, we'll be dealing with this for quite some time, depending on how extensive that we get into this sign uh, and apply it to this particular uh, scripture. But let's read Matthew chapter 12, beginning in verse 38. How many of you got that opening? Say amen. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. Now this word sign there in the Greek means uh, something that would distinguish him from among others. It is used many times to denote a miracle. But they, want, they wanted something that would make them aware of what this man was really all about. They wanted something that would distinguish him from all others. So they said, give us a sign. And Jesus then, in verse 38, said, an evil and an adulterous generation seeks after a sign. Now that's a tremendous, that is a tremendous statement in light of what's going on in the church world today. I mean, we, we really need to spend time meditating that. They said, uh, uh, Jesus, we want a sign from thee. And Jesus said, now, now listen to me. He said, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. What's he saying there? He said, I'm not going to give you a sign because, he, because the world in their whoredoms seek a sign. In other words, he's saying, listen, the world will do anything. They'll go anywhere. They'll be a part of anything. They'll give themselves to whatever is supernatural in nature. Oh, they'll run after that. And he said, that's not what you need. An evil and an adulterous generation seek, I'm not going to satisfy your whoredoms. I'm not going to satisfy your desire to involve yourselves in some just supernatural thing. Then he goes on to say, there shall no sign be given to it, that adul adulterous and, and uh, evil generation, but, now notice, the sign of the prophet Jonah. Now he said there, there is something that's going to touch them eternally. It's not going to be a, what you would normally call miracle, although there was great miraculous uh, aspects to what he was talking about here. But he said, the sign of the prophet Jonah is what they're after. Then he goes on in verse 40. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now this is the sign. The sign has to do with a three day and three night period. Just as Jonah was in the heart or in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, so must the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. Now that was a sign back then. And this was a sign to an evil and adulterous generation. Now he goes on to say then, the men of Nineveh, verse 41, shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold, a greater than Jonah is here. Father, we do thank you for a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Jesus. The eyes of our understanding being enlightened that we might know the hope of his calling, that we might understand the inheritance that he has in us and the exceeding greatness of his power that is to usward who believe even that resurrection power with which you raised him from the dead. Lord, our desire in this message is to see him and in seeing him we know that it will produce him in our own lives. Now, we thank you for this, Father. Not just a, a, little, a little, little wisdom and a little revelation, but a spirit of it loosed among us. Not only today, but all during the while we study this word. We praise you for it in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I, I was interested in this statement that Jesus made in the, in the 41st verse. 
it says, They repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, a greater than Jonah is here. Jonah had a message. After the three days and three nights of his experience in that whale's belly, he was ready to preach. I'll say it this way. Let me say it this way because this is actually the way I believe the Spirit of God would have it to be interpreted. After the three days and three nights, there was a message available that when heard brought repentance to this evil and adulterous generation. Nineveh was one of the most wicked cities that we have any history of in our, in our uh, uh, old aspect of history. But they repented at a message that was preached after three days and three nights. Jesus is relaying that and likening that to something that will be spoken after his experience in the heart of the earth. I'm telling you, this is the sign the world needs today. This is the sign the church needs today. This is the message of the gospel. Now, we know that Jesus was talking here about his death, his burial, his resurrection, and subsequent ascension, don't we? We know that there was a three-day and three-night period of time that lasted, we call it, from the cross to the throne. Jesus spent three days and three nights, the most important three-day and three-night period of time that the history of the world has ever experienced occurred 2,000 years ago in, in the which Jesus wrought redemption for all of us. Can you say amen to that? Happened in a three-day and three-night period. Now, many other things that Jesus involved himself in were important. But from the cross to the throne took three days and three nights. Jesus said that's the sign that will bring great release. That's the sign. Now, we need more than just to state in, in, in open boldness that Jesus died was buried and rose again in those three days. One of the things in the, in the vast amount of time that I've had just to meditate in the last couple of weeks, one of the things that I've dwelt on a lot is why is it that uh, some people just grasp the message of the cross, realizing that it is the answer to them and to the world, and others just seem to, well, agree with it, but it doesn't grip them. I mean, I thought about that for hours. I, I just prayed and the Spirit of God began to deal with me about that. And see, uh, that's the purpose for this message. Because when you talk about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ, we can say it's the gospel, but what do you mean? What do you think about when we think about, when we talk about, when we dwell on, bring up those three days and three nights? What happened there? I, I, don't answer me out loud, but think, what really occurred there? What took place? Somebody said, well, Jesus died. Well, let me say it this way. Why did Jesus die? What was really going on in God's mindset when Jesus was sent to the cross to die? Now, let me show you what I'm talking about here because the Christian world is going to mature or stay the same dependent upon their views of what happened there. Your maturity, your growing up, your expression of Christ, you becoming everything God wants you to be, depends on your ideas and beliefs concerning those three days and three nights. Say amen if you understand at least what I'm talking about. Whatever went on there, see, and see, we can be talking about the same death, the same burial, the same resurrection, and you could be thinking one thing, and, and, and I could be thinking altogether another thing. Let me show you the different views of the church world's ideas of what went on there. There's, there's called the moral view. Now, this is the view the vast majority of Christendom has. Now, see, we're going to think a little bit today. How many of you wouldn't mind if you came to church and, 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 and had to think a little bit today? I trust that this is a thinking gathering. We need to think. I'm telling you we need to think. We make so many statements. I hear them on television. I hear them in tapes. I hear them from the mouths of believers that have absolutely no... See, they never thought those things through. I go to conferences sometimes when speakers say things and they couldn't have thought those things through. If they just thought them through, hear what I'm saying? 
thought them through, they would never make such ridiculous statements about the person and work of Christ. See, we're as a church, as a whole, we're not a thinking people. You understand what I'm saying? We haven't thought things through. Now here are some ways people think about the redemptive work of Christ. Bear with me as we begin this series and let's, let's consider some things. First of all, the vast majority of Christendom today believes in the moral view of the cross. By that I mean that most Christians view the cross as Jesus dying as a martyr for a good cause. The, the teaching goes something like this. God was ready to change the law into the age of grace. So he sent his son. And Jesus for three and a half years preached that God loved everybody now. That it wasn't any longer acceptance on the basis of doing things, but acceptance on the basis of receiving him and his gospel of love. He was rejected because of that by the natural Jew. And they threatened him and threatened him until it came to the point when he must understand he's going to have to give his life because of this message. And the teaching goes on to say he was willing to pay the price because the cause was worth it. And so he allowed them to kill him. He was willing to give his life because of the message of the love of God. Now see, that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? And in all of these views, you see, there are certain aspects of truth. The story goes on that after three days and three nights, God raised Jesus from the dead to prove that that message that he was preaching was in fact the truth. That's the moral view. They view Jesus' death as nothing more or nothing less than the death of a martyr, someone who died for a good cause, someone who thought enough of the message and enough of the purpose to go ahead and be killed by it, for it. Well, that sounds good, but it doesn't do the job. What's wrong with all that? Well, to be honest with you, first of all, if it took a martyr's death, how many of you know Stephen's death would have been enough to get that job done? Stephen was a martyr. Stephen had the life of God. Stephen thought enough of the message to die for the message. And then after this moral view is preached, Someone will then get up and challenge you. Well, if Jesus thought enough of the message to die for it, shouldn't you? If Jesus thought enough of it to die for it, shouldn't you show up on Sunday morning? If Jesus thought enough of the message to die for it, shouldn't you be a tither? So they equate his death to a martyr's death. And, and the cause is so great. Well, the problem with that is it has nothing to do with substitution. It doesn't change. People who have that view, by and large, see themselves as adhering to a cause. You understand what I'm saying today? They see themselves as being challenged to believe a cause, to believe a series of teaching, to believe a gospel, to be such, to be just as dedicated about what you're doing as he was. Be a good prayer. After all, Jesus was willing to die. But see, that leaves you just the same as you were before, only with a line of teaching to adhere to. A line of things to believe. And so we call ourselves Christians because we believe in the Christian line of truth. We believe what Jesus taught. See, how many of you understand? That church is the great majority of what is believed in the church world. Oh, I think sometimes that's what we... I hope that's not what you believe. See, there's, in, there, there's great aspects of truth in that. But see, that the, the, the work of the death, burial, and resurrection was much more than that. What happened in the three days and three... That's not what Jesus was talking about. He wasn't talking about... Listen, if it was the death of a martyr, why did he sweat drops of blood right before that happened? Martyrs don't do that. They say, light the fire. Martyrs say, pull the trigger. It's worth it. But Jesus faced the cross not as a martyr. Oh, he faced the cross with great dread. Oh, if there's any other way, take this cup from me. That doesn't sound like a martyr. That sounds like somebody didn't want to go through with that. Jesus knew that in just a few short minutes, 
he would not be a martyr, but he would actually identify with those for whom he was dying. So a moral view. And see, can you see in that? Yeah, we could be very, very dogmatic about our beliefs, but never grow up spiritually believing that. Then there's another group of people, somewhat smaller group, that believe that what Jesus did was a pattern for all of us. And their teaching goes that Jesus became a son. In fact, the scripture says this in Hebrew. He, he became, he was uh, perfected by the things he suffered. And then the teaching goes that you will also be perfected. I believe in perfection. I believe in maturity. I believe that the work of the cross will produce nothing short of perfection in the body. I believe that. But see, that teaching, uh, one line of teaching, this is called the, the pattern view, looks at what Jesus did as a pattern for us. In other words, he was crucified, he died, and he was buried, and you're going to have to be also. If it took a crucifixion, death, and burial, if it took that amount of suffering to get him into the perfection that he re- is now uh, in, then you also must go on with that. You must also have a crucifixion. And many, you see, that teaching goes on to say that the sufferings that you're presently going through are part of your crucifixion experience. But the only problem with that is, it doesn't, see, see this is something people don't think. People don't think when I hear that being taught, I I, I often want to ask the question, has nobody suffered enough? Has nobody been through enough to produce the sun in them? Has nobody... I don't see anybody grown up into perfection yet, do you? Are you telling me that the sufferings, nobody suffered? Why, I know people who have suffered the pains of cancer and died from it. Physically gone away. Physically left this earth. See, we don't think things through. Oh, I believe that we must have a crucifixion, death, and burial. But I believe his crucifixion, death, and burial was the one to bring us to perfection. We're in the one who who was brought to perfection. Can anybody say amen? Oh, I don't want this to be boring this morning. But I'm telling you, just because we say death, burial, and resurrection... People don't link up with us because they're thinking different things about that. Oh, we all believe it, but what what about it do you believe? Now, another view, this is the third one. Another view is, is the view of ransom. And this view says that what happened to Jesus was, in fact, a payment being made. And there's a great aspect of truth in this. Now, there's two sides to this. First of all, uh, there's, the, there's the group of people who believe that the payment was made to the devil to set us free. Now see, you may laugh at that, but there's a large number of charismatics who believe that. That what happened to Jesus was God freeing us from the grasp of the devil. In other words, paying us buying us from the, from the grips of the evil one through the death, burial, and resurrection. That he came into this earth and paid a price that was sufficient, therefore bartered with our souls and said, here, Mr. Devil, here is the price, now let those people free. A lot of people feel that way. A lot of people think that way. Well, there's a, that, that particular line of truth is just got a lot of holes in it. First of all, can you imagine God bartering with the devil? What do you what what'll you take? What'll you take for Bradley's soul there? Well, I tell you, if you send your own son and let him die and go to hell and be raised again the third day, that'll be sufficient for me. I'll just let that man go free. How many of you realize Satan's a thief and a liar? <laughs> You're not going to barter with him and get away with anything. See in the, see. The reason people think that is because in the first place, whatever Jesus did, did free us from the grip of the devil. Colossians 1.13 said we've been delivered from the power of darkness. But you see what Jesus did produced deliverance from, from the power of the enemy, but it wasn't to the enemy that God was doing this. It wasn't for him. See, when Adam fell, Adam, Adam produced 
uh, death in all of us, and it is that death that causes us to be in the grip of the enemy in the first place. When death leaves, then the enemy must leave. Right. Jesus didn't come to barter with the devil. He come to destroy him. That's right. Boy, we're theological this morning, aren't we? There's another view that what happened to Jesus was ransom, but it was ransom that God needed. In other words, it was payment to God. And I, I, I'm, we're getting closer to the truth in every one of these. Payment to God. In other words, God said, well, in order to get man free, I'm going to have to have some kind of a suffering, some kind of a death, some kind of, a, of, a, of an, a, an action to pay for the wages of sin that all of us had to pay. So God sent his son, and, and, and over there by his own self, God, uh, uh, God sent his son, and Jesus died and was raised the third day, and God accepted that as payment in full for what we did. Well, that's, that's good, except in that teaching it still leaves you over here and in him over there. It's paramount to saying this. Somebody, let's say a man is a rapist. He is found guilty of, of, of 21 occurrences of rape. And so he's going to be sent to the, to the death. He's going to be killed because of it. He's going, to be, he's going to be electrocuted. Well, somebody stands up with boldness and says, I want to die for that man. I want to pay the price that he owes. And so another man goes to the electric chair and he dies a death that this man... The only problem is... Uh, we still got a rapist on our hands here. No change. We still got trouble. See, God didn't do something just instead of you. He did something with you. Oh, I'm not just... This is so important. See, I, I just wondered, Lord, would, will, will they be willing to think this morning? See, all of these, I'm saying to you, all of these are various mindsets of people not only possibly in here, but people who get these tapes all over the country and in other countries. People think that's what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. You've got to understand that's not what I'm... See, if you think that, if you think that Jesus did something over there to pay a price for you, and you were here, and he was there, then you still see yourself as that rapist. You still see yourself as that sinner, but thank God you're forgiven. Redemption is more than just forgiveness. Right. What Jesus did wrought more than just forgiveness. Now let's get into what the cross was really about. We're getting down to the nitty gritty. Jesus, here's the fifth view, that Jesus' actions was in fact a substitution that brought satisfaction. Substitution. Say that word with me. Substitution. Now the word, if you look up the word in your dictionary, substitute, you will find this, uh, you will find this definition. One who what? Takes the place of another. One who takes the place of another. Now, here's the false way to look at that. How? And we see all these, he died for... For God so loved the world, He sent His only begotten Son. He died for the world. Romans 8 says uh, that God commended His love. Listen, He commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died what? For us. But here's what, you, this is important. Put your thinker on right now. Think, 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 think. Right now, think about what Brother Gary is saying. Think about it. Because what do you think I'm saying when the Bible says, for us. For us. Now there's a right way and a wrong way to think of that. For us. How many of you know Jesus went to the cross for you? How many of you know Jesus died for you? How many of you know He was buried for you? Yeah. How many of you know He was raised for you? But what do you think I'm saying when I say for you? Better yet, what do you think Think God's saying when he said Christ died for you. Think a minute. Think. He is not saying that Jesus died instead of you. 
Now that's what most people think, see. We're eliminating all of what a lot of people think. Most people think when Jesus died for you, the same thing as, well, uh, Aaron went to the grocery store for me. That means he went there instead of me. But Jesus didn't die instead of you. See, that leaves you the same person you were before. The, the, yeah, one who takes the place of another. But how did Jesus take your place? Not instead of you, but as you. Glory to God. It wasn't instead of you. It was how He took your place. He didn't go there instead of you. He went there as you. In other words, it's not Aaron going to the grocery store as me or, or for me. It's him showing up as me at the grocery store. It's the people at the grocery store saying, Brother Gary came here today. Oh, oh we're getting to the next. See, can you understand all of these other ways of thinking sound right, but they leave us short of really being changed. Right. Jesus didn't go instead of us. He went as us. And He did that through the law of identification. Everybody say identification. <clears throat> identification means to consider or treat as the same. Now who view? See, the people at the grocery store said, I saw Gary Garner here. When in fact Aaron went, I saw. Now the only way that can happen is that somewhere between my house and the grocery store, Aaron actually had a change. He became, he, was, he looked like, he talked like, his actions were like. Me. That's the only way. You understand that? Something had to happen to Aaron between the house and the grocery store. Something happened in Jesus' life between heaven and the cross that made God view Christ as me. That, that, that made God view Christ as you. Because He became so much like you that God said. See, that's what makes it. It's not what you believe. It isn't. It, it, it ultimately rests ultimately rest in what you believe. But what you believe must be based on what God believes. Right. It's not based, see, uh, somebody says, Oh, I believe the moral view. I believe the pattern view. I believe the ransom views. Well, see, the, the, the real change can only come if we view it the way God views it. God doesn't view it as a moral act. God doesn't view the death of Christ as the death of a martyr. God doesn't view the death of Christ as a pattern. God doesn't view the death of Christ as a ransom. God views it as a substitution that provided satisfaction. In Isaiah, he said, I, I saw the travail of his soul and I was satisfied. We will only be satisfied with the same satisfaction that he's satisfied with if we view it with his eyes. We say, the sign of Jonah. And we say, oh yes, three, three days and three nights, Jesus did something because the cause was worthy. Jesus did something as a pattern. Je are those things?
everything we can to get to make sure that the body of Christ is thinking properly, I wonder and I wonder, why don't people get thrilled about this? Why doesn't it grip them? Because they have a different view of the cross. If Jesus went to the cross as a martyr because the cause was great, well, then it's left up to you to pump yourself up. It's left up to you to just be a good trooper. It's left up to you to just be faithful because he was. Not faithful with his faithfulness, but be, be faithful with... Don't you love the Lord, brother? Well, I want to. I really try. I try, Brother Gary, to love the Lord. See, in Christ you realize that the love of the Lord is the love that Christ has because it is Him that you're in. It's His love that you're loving with. You're not to conjure up a like love. It's His love. You don't come up with another plan. Oh, I wonder what he knew. I wonder what he knew. I wonder what he knew. Oh, God, I wish I could love like Jesus. You have the same love that you're in him. And so because we view the cross as something less than what it really was, we still, we're 2,000 years from the cross, and we still are just like we used to be. Oh, we know more. We can quote Scripture. we got a lot of revelation knowledge. We can show these death, burial, and resurrection places, but we still remain the same because our view is wrong. We're looking at it with eyes other than Him, than His. Jesus' death was not instead of us. Jesus took upon himself a mighty change during those three days and three nights. All the Bible said he offered himself without spot to God, but he didn't remain without spot to God. In 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 21, the Scripture says, He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us. There was a great change on the way to the grocery store. There was a great change on the way to the ascension. Jesus was tempted in every way like as we are yet without sin. But on, his, on, the way to the, on the way to the throne, something happened. He changed. Identification means to, to, to consider or treat as the same. It, it isn't, somebody says, well, what you need to do is identify with the work on the cross. Well, what we need to do is find out what God identified the work on the cross with. How did God view it? God views it as a substitution that provides satisfaction. It was so legal, so absolutely legal, that God said, I'm satisfied. Now see, the only reason that Bradley Catlett, that Gary Garner, that anybody in this building would not be satisfied with the work of Christ... If the truth was known, how many people in this building today are not satisfied with what's going on in your life? See, how many people in this world, in this building today, are not satisfied with your relationship to Christ? We're not satisfied with your relationship to God through Christ. If you're not satisfied, it's because you don't view it with the same view that God has. Am I getting this message across? If we saw it the way God saw it, If he was satisfied, wouldn't we be? The sign of the prophet Jonah. The preaching of that sign brought Nineveh to repentance. The most wicked city. See, uh, Jonah was delivered from the belly of hell. How many of you know that wasn't a pleasant place? It wasn't a pleasant place. So, ah, <laughs> this has been bubbling in me. This has been, I, I, I don't know, you know, so, I, I realize, and we'll get into this, I realize that s- some, uh, my, my desire, my, my craving, my, my calling is to preach the death, burial, and resurrection. But sometime, church, we've got to sit down and, and just say, now what are we talking about? Now what are we really saying? What are you saying, Brother Gary? What are you saying? What is the death, burial, and resurrection anyway? It's not a martyr's death. It's not a pattern death. It's not just a ransom death. It is a death 
that was a substitution. Now, what we've got to do then, and this is what we're going to do in, in, the, in the process of time, Sister Helen, we're going to show you how. Now, see, we can sit here and say, oh, I believe Jesus' death was my death. But then we have to answer, see, thinking man says, now, how could that happen? How could that happen? I thought many times, now, how could I have died on the cross 2,000 years before I was ever born? You ever, you, ever ask, you ever ask questions like how? How could I have died 2,000 years before? See, that's what, that's, what, that's what gathering together unto him is all about. It's asking, it's thinking, it's going to school, it's letting the Spirit of God, and I'm telling you it's not wrong. I, I, I hear sometimes preachers say, well, you shouldn't ask why. I'm telling you, you should ask why. You should say, now, I don't understand that. Now, how could I? How could I have done that? I'm going to show you how. We're going to show you how. The Holy Spirit's going to teach us how Aaron became who I was before he got over to the grocery store. How could that happen? How I was in corp- How could God view me there? I wasn't even born yet. How did God know who I was going to be? How did God know the sins I was going to commit? I'll show you. The Bible teaches us. The Bible says exactly. Ha <laughs> ha. And so, this is what we're going to do. We're going to hold the sign of Jonah before you. Jesus said, I'm not going to give you a sign. An evil and adulterous generation seeks after miracles. How many of you know God does miracles? How many of you know God's not the only spirit that does miracles? How many of you know sometimes people can't tell the difference? How many of you know the Bible teaches according to the end, according, uh, closer we get to the end of this age, it'll be harder to tell the difference. Do you know why that is? It's because God's going to replace his supernatural outward manifestation with a greater supernatural inward manifestation. We're not going to be excited about seeing things outwardly. We're not even going to be moved by those. We're going to be excited about seeing things inwardly, seeing who we are. Isaiah 8.18 says, You and your children are for signs and wonders. Could it be that same sign? Could it be that we will be manifestations of that same sign that Jesus said the three days and three nights? Could it be that we will actually bear the testimony of what happened to him in those three days and three nights? I believe that's likely. Somebody will. The testimony of Christ will be confirmed in us. Well, what is his testimony? In closing, I'll say this. If we had a testimony service today and... what would Jesus testify to? He would stand up and say, 2,000 years ago, I was crucified. I died and I was buried. But on the third day, I was made alive. Then I was raised and then I ascended. And then, you know something? We said, well, Sister Ruby, now you get up and testify. You know what? There'll come a time when our testimony will be 2,000 years ago I was crucified. I died. And I was buried. It'll be more than Oh, God met my rent payment the other day. That's good. That's good. Be more than Oh, God helped me catch a five-pound catfish the other day. That's good. <laughs> That's good, but you always want to say, did you have a scale with you? (laughs) No. Those are good. Oh, for the day when the body of Christ, not because it's words, not because it's just the end thing to say, but because we're driven with that thought, I was crucified with Christ. Oh, man. And so Jesus... The head is sitting over there, and I said, wait a minute, now, 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 wait a minute, that sounds a whole lot like, that's the, that's the, you and Jesus have the same testimony. Well, you see, I'm in him. I'm no place else in, but in him. See, he's an environment. He's my place. He's where I be. I be in Christ. I showed up at the grocery store in the person of my son. So much. My son became so much like me. 
that they said Gary Garner was here. See? So my testimony would be, his testimony would be, I went to the grocery store. What should my testimony be? I went to the grocery store. Because we became one together. Oh, glory. Glory to God. If there ever was, if there ever was a reason to shout, if there ever was a reason to throw a runaway, if there ever was a reason to have a, 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 a hallelujah march, it would be because of what I've said this morning. There ever was a reason. This is better than getting healed, although healing is involved in this. It's better than when in the Reader's Digest sweepstakes. This is better, better, better. It is ultimate. It's everything. The greatest thing God had to offer was a death, burial, and resurrection. And you were there. Somebody says, well, thank God it's over. Well, that's true, but thank God it's still working. That which was over is still working in you. See, a lot of people say, well, Brother Gary, that just leaves off God's dealings with us. You say it's a finished work. Oh, no, if it is a finished work, the dealings just begin. If it's a finished work, then the Spirit of God never quits. He says, now listen, these things are true. Now you must line up. It never stops. It never stops. The worm dieth not. Oh, man. The worm, it, see? Oh, praise God. Well... We're being put in a place. Jesus said uh, over and over, Psalm 22, uh, uh, Psalm of the Cross. He said, I am a worm and no man. That's pretty rough, isn't it? He became as a worm and no man, he said. That was his confession on the cross, Psalm 92. And I'm telling you, the revealing of the Son in the people says there's a place where people go where the worm dies not. The worm just keeps on eating at the flesh. Now, that's not talking about natural things. That's talking about spiritual. And that worm just keeps eating away, eating away, eating away. The message of what happened to Jesus never stops dealing with you. You just can't get the worm to die. You just can't get him to leave you alone until every ounce of flesh is removed. Now, some of you may or some of you may not have got what I just said. But I'm telling you, I hope, <laughs> I hope we are found in a place where that worm doesn't die. That, that eating away and gnawing and won't you leave me alone, Spirit of God? How long does it take to manifest until every part of you is consumed and only he remains? Stand to your feet with me. So forget that business about, well, thank God. Thank God, Jesus did it, and now it's over. Well, Jesus did it, and it ain't over. <laughs> it keep, Jesus did it, and it keeps being did. You understand that? Jesus did it, and it just keeps on being did. I'm saying that right. That's exactly what I mean to say. Jesus did it, and it keeps on being did. I mean to say it that way. It's a finished work, but it keeps on being finished. Won't leave me alone. Won't leave me alone. Keeps on being dead. And it's going to stay dead until you die. Out where people can see it. Oh, God. Let us be thinking people. Let us be thinking people. See? We don't run away from the dealings. <laughs> I wanted to say, we don't run from the diddings of God. <laughs> See, we, that's where we need to be. Right there where it's being did. I need to be where it's being did. <laughs> Oh, something he did, but it's still being did right here. Right here. See, I love it. See, I love that. I love that. See, you don't need to run from the fire. You need to run into it. 
just run right in where it's the hottest. See, those three Hebrew children went into a fire uh, that was seven times hotter. They weren't burnt, but the things that bound them were burnt. They came out of there free. You know why? Because there was another man in the fire with them. He was in there with them. Did you get anything at all out of this message today? See, this is the way to view the cross. This is the way to view what was done. <laughs> it's, a, it's a way, oh God, oh God, why are you chasing me? Chasing me? See, it's, not a, it, it's, 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 a, it's a cross that is working within you. And see, we can't look at each other and judge because of this, that, and the other. We just say, let it be dead, Lord. Just let that continue to work. Father, we just love you today. We just love you today, and we thank you and we praise you, Lord, for what you're doing in the hour. Lord, we thank you that we're able to think. We're able to use our minds, and we thank you that the gospel is, is not a mystery to those who are involved in it, that Jesus came by the power of his Spirit to reveal to us, to unfold the mystery. And that mystery is Christ in us, the hope of glory. So we thank and praise you that we're understanding, we're realizing, and we're beginning to be able to verbalize this great end-time message. What is, it the, what is it the end of, Father, but the end of us and the beginning of Christ, the creation of God? Now I ask you, Lord, to let these things by the power of your Spirit, sink down into the very lives of all of us that we might understand what God is doing in this hour. This is the sign of Jonah. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen and Amen. Praise God. Sing one song. Let's sing one song. You got one? One song. Let's all sing it.